So let's, uh, let's just begin, um, I guess the, the topic is uh, going through the Haggadah, so we'll just give a short introduction, and then we'll go through the Haggadah, which the main part of the Haggadah is, is a Magid, we're not going to touch on the Halachas, we'll just discuss and prepare ourselves for our own uh, Pesach Sadarim. Okay, so here we go. First and foremost, one thing to always keep in mind um, is the, the ambiance of the of the Pesach Seder, right? It's a it's a time of tremendous simcha. It's a tr- time of tremendous gladness. It's a time of tremendous hoda. A time of tremendous gratitude, and um, and sometimes people uh, can forget about this uh, with all the preparations that come leading up to Pesach, and then finally we come to we show up at the Pesach Seder and everybody's just plopping down and all you know the the mother or wife is all knocked out and tired from all the cleaning and cooking that's been done. And everybody's all stressed out. The kids are overtired. So we can say whatever we want about, uh, about the Divrei Torah and all those things that are going to be taking place. But if the ambiance and the atmosphere is, uh, is not one of tremendous joy and, uh, and tremendous gratitude, everything else is pretty much uh, is going to be affected negatively. There's certainly... No question about it, because the, the focus is joy and gratitude. I'm going to keep repeating these words. Joy at being a member of Am Yisrael and Am Kaddish, and the tremendous gratitude that we have um, with, uh, with Yitzhiyah Mishraim, with coming out of Mitzrayim. Now, the halacha states that um, on the Seder night, the Seder should begin promptly. Obviously, not if it's going to, dip, if it's, not if it's going to take away from the Simcha and the Hulah. Right? People come home, we've got to start now. Right, that, that messes the whole thing up. Right, now, what if what if the whoever is preparing the Pesach Seder is not ready? So you just already uh, started off on the wrong foot. So Allah says we want to try to begin as soon as possible because there's going to be five mitzvahs during the night that every Jew is obligated in. Right, as we know, the two the two uh, biblical commandments, the two mitz, mitzvahs midaraisa, are achilas matzah, eating the matzah on the Seder night, and also Sipur Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, telling over the story of Mitzrayim, which is what the Haggadah actually means. Magid means to tell over. That's what Haggadah means. Mr is to say. When you say, you just say things. Magid, Haggadah, means to expound on things, to tell stories, to make it a matzah. You know, as much as people complain that, um, as much as people complain that, oh, the Pesach Seder takes so long, right, and, and all these things, you're right. A person needs to needs to be uh, needs to be smart about it. Um, but at the same time, um, there's there, it's supposed to be a time of stories and expressing and different time. It should be exciting. It's really it's got to be uh, it's got to be a very exciting time. We got to Levincha by Yomahu, particularly the night uh, of the the Seder night. We need the children to stay awake. The primary mitzvah is to pass this story from generation to generation which is also why the Manishtana takes place at the beginning of the Seder, because we're concerned the kids are going to fall asleep. So we want them to ask their questions right away in the beginning so we have this mitzvah um, fulfilled. But the focus has to be one of excitement. In order to be one of excitement, we have to do what we're doing right now, and that is study up what happened. It's an, it's an incredible thing. And when we t- tell this to our children, and we express the way that they all know the story of Moshe in the box, and they know the story of... Pyro throwing all the kids into the Nile River. And they know all these things, but when we bring it all together under the banner of Amuna, it becomes comical. It becomes funny for us. It becomes funny for our children to the point where the Pusik itself writes that the mitzvah is to say that Vigarta Levincha Vayemaho, tell over to your children. This that I made a mockery out of Mitzrayim. Because Baruch Hu didn't just do miracles. Hakadosh Baruch Hu, as they say in Yiddish, he made he made minced minced meat out of them. It's hysterical. It's hysterical what Hakadosh Baruch Hu did. He's killing millions of babies, chucking them into the river. Not only the Jewish children. Then he moves on to the to the Egyptian boys because his astrologers see that there's one kid who's going to be the savior. Right? And Paro doesn't know if it's going to be Jewish, Egyptian. He has no clue. He's chucking every baby into the Nile River that he finds. Millions of babies are being killed. What does Hashem do? Classic God. The one baby that Paro is out to get, Hashem comes to puts him into the Nile River. Right? And this is what we're telling over to our children. Hello? <laughs> and then Paro's daughter 
comes down to the river, and she brings this boy home, right? You make up, you, you tell the whole story. She brings the boy home. Paro starts playing Legos with this kid who she names Maisha. That wasn't even the name that his parents gave him, right? It's the name that Kimina uh, Mayimi Shisiu because Basia pulled him out of the water. So Basia brings him into Paro's palace. Paro's playing Legos with him, helping change his diapers, Mastama, probably helping out with that also. He starts paying his tuition. He starts, you know, feeding him mashed potatoes and cereal and milk for breakfast. And he, the Moshe's trying on Paro's crown. Paro's now the, the proud Zaidi. Until Maisha Rabbeinu grows up, and then he goes out. But what, this one kid, this is how it comes to Baruch Hu works. You know, these kids, are, our children are sitting there, other, we're sitting there, and we're like, this isn't just like others Baruch Hu performing miracles. It's a mockery. They're trying to do whatever they can to get this one boy. And this brother says, oh, Paro, you think you're so great? You're going to pay his tuition, you'll change his diapers, you do this, you do that, and now when he's 18 years old, he'll start causing trouble, you're going to try to kill him, it's going to execute the executioner, and, you know, he runs away, and then he ends up uh, 80 years old when we meet him, and he's now, uh, he's going to become the leader of Kali Israel. The way it all comes together, this, there's, there's got to be uh, a theme, there's got to be excitement to this, uh, to this story, but it's all about a moon, it's all about gratitude, it's fun, these things are, these things are, Exciting and it's entertaining and it's it's brings so much haida and gratitude to the greatness of Hakadosh Baruch Hu. Specifically at the Seder night for those who are able, so it's it's uh, to tell over to the younger ones because whether it's our children or not our children, it's um, it's the the way that the sages instituted and the way that really Yiddishkeit works is its transmission from generation to generation. And you know nowadays we have a whole day school system. You know, Baruch Hashem, it's very, it's needed. But what that causes is that a lot of the parents take their responsibilities of transmitting the Masorah to their children and put it on the back burner. So at least particularly at the Seder night, we have to make sure that we keep a, we keep a, a focus on the, on the chinuch, on the education, and on the relating all that took place to, uh, to our children. Okay. Let's begin. Let's begin the Seder. Kaddish. Okay? We begin by Kiddush. A few short thoughts on Kiddush. This year it's going to be Friday night. So we're going to begin by saying Yom Hashishi. We begin by uh, starting what we do uh, on, every, uh, on every Shabbos. And then we move on to a holiday Kiddush, to a Yom Tov Kiddush with the inserts of Shabbos. I, just, I want to share a few thoughts that I had on Kiddush that may be a good idea to bring out uh, at some point during um, during the uh, during the Haggad, okay, we say Baruch Atah Hashem Lekinu Vachelam Asher Bachar Banu Mikalam. You've chosen us from all the other nations. V'Reim Emanu Mikalash, and you've elevated us from all the other tongues. V'Kiddushanu B'Mitzvaysav. You sanctify us when we perform mitzvahs. Right. This is all part of the the theme and the gratitude of being an Am Kadosh, of being a holy a holy nation. The Kiddush, the words of Kiddush itself, are really setting the tone. For the Magid, for the Pesach Seder, and Hakadosh Baruch Hu, you gave us with love Moadim Lesimcha. You gave us, you gave us Mayadim Lesimcha. You gave us holidays with uh, with which to rejoice. My father Zechariah Lebracha would say over <clears throat> that it doesn't it doesn't actually mean Mayadim Lesimcha doesn't mean that you should rejoice on a holiday. Mayadim Lesimcha means that Moadim are the things that bring the Simcha. So it's actually. It's actually a, um, a, a bracha that the, the moed itself, the holiday itself, should be the thing that helps bring simcha for the rest of the year and helps bring simcha into our lives, which means that it's not, you know, maybe we're, we're on the wrong derech when it comes to Yom Taivim and focusing on the wrong things. It's supposed to be a time of, uh, of a tremendous joy. Because we give us this Chag HaMatzis, it's a time of chirus. It's a time of of freedom, as we know the sages teach us. The only person who's free is a person who is immersed in uh, in Torah. And um, the, we'll explain a little bit later on how it is that if we find constantly throughout the Torah to be servants. 
to be, we find in, in the Pesukim of the Torah, right? You should be servants to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We're always talking about the servitude. So if we're constantly talking about the servitude, it's a little, uh, it's, a, it's a big contradiction to go ahead and say, oh, by the way, the greatest cherus, the greatest freedom is a person who's involved in Torah. So that, that needs uh, explanation as well to focus on the, the Zman Chirusenu. And then the part of Kiddash to make the fact that all this is really sanctifying us and elevating us is really all part of, like we said before, um, of, uh, of setting the tone. Okay. Then we go ahead, we wash our hands, we dip, we dip, um, the, um, we dip the vegetables into the salt water. Okay, there's things to explain over there. Uh, as well, that it all, that's, uh, I mean, that gets a little bit into halacha, the why we wash before dipping it into the, dipping it into the, the, the vegetable, into the salt water. Um, but just halacha to keep in mind by that is to, to not use a utensil. Usually, and my wife doesn't like this at all. Uh, she's like, if we're not going to use a fork, everyone needs to put on a glove. And that also <laughs> defeats the purpose. Right? She doesn't need everybody sticking their fingers into her celery or potatoes or whatever the minog is. But uh, it actually started because in the times of, of uh, the Beis HaMikdash, when we had the Tumah and Tyra, purity and impurity, and things which became wet can, uh, can become impure. So people were washing their hands. Um, the thing is, if you use a utensil, then there was no issue of your hands, which were impure, touching this thing which is now wet. So, it's, I'm, I'm not going to tell you what to do at your own uh, Pesach Seder, but my wife's not too happy that at our Seder I try to have everybody, I tell her, just put a long celery stick. And they could each touch an end and do that instead of chopping up the little pieces, make it a little longer. And people aren't uh, sticking their fingers into, uh, <laughs> people aren't sticking their fingers into your stuff. Okay. We then split the matzah. Okay, and the reason why we split the matzah um, is is uh, because it's the way of poor people, which is, we're going to, I'll explain how this all comes together, but it's the way of poor people to always put aside food from what they have for later on, because they're always nervous that, uh, that they're not going to have enough right now. All right. Now, now we begin by saying, Halach Ba'anya. The Magid begins, which Magid is for the Haggadah, they would give me saying, Halach Banya, this is an invitation that everybody should join our Seder. This is where it gets exciting. Okay? First of all, why is matzah called poor man's bread? Why is it called poor man's bread? Um, okay, so uh, two answers. First of all, it's called poor man's bread because it doesn't rise. And poor people never look full. So this also doesn't look full. Another reason is because matzah takes a long time to digest. And if we're people who are poor, and, th and this is a very, very important concept for the Seder, okay? People who are poor, they need to feel full for longer because, they don't, because they're not going to have food later on. Why is this welcome to the poor people written in Aramaic? Because when it was written, first of all, Pashup Shot is that people spoke Aramaic, and since we're inviting poor people, um, we, want them to, uh, we want them to understand that, um, that, uh, that they're being invited. Um, and at the same time, um, the reason why nowadays we do it behind doors is because it, it seems that it became a custom, it became, uh, not a custom, it became a thing where um, both Jews and non-Jews began attending this open, uh, taking part of this open invitation, which led to a lot of halachic uh, issues. Um, because the original halach ma'anya was spoken out, out loud in shul. And it became very much like the Machlis house. Uh, I don't know if anybody read the book of Rebbe Machlis, but we were neighbors with her incredible, incredible family. Of who knows how many people every, every shop. It's just open to everybody. Everybody knew it was just open. You need food, you just go to their house, right? So in need, at a certain point, we began saying it. Of course, we, we, we began saying it behind closed doors. What do we do in its place now? So in its place now, what we do is ma'os right? We take care, we make sure that the poor have money before Pesach. We send them matzah, we send them food. In some communities, like over here, the body here has a, has a ma'os fund. But all this stems from the same purpose as halach ma'anya. We're opening our doors, we're making sure that everybody who needs a seder is prepared for one and has a, 
and has uh, and has proper food. Now, the question is, if the focus is joy and gratitude, why are we starting out our seder with the negative? This is the poor man's bread, right? We're not full. Uh, we're we're flat, right? We need food that's going to keep us uh, full for longer. And the whole purpose of it is joy and gratitude, and we're starting focusing on the on the negative. So what's up with this? So that's the the answer is many of us may know this already, but this is a great segue for for really the theme of the entire Pesach Seder, and that is you tell over a short uh, short parable, a short mushal. There's a king traveling uh, along a, a road of his land. He comes across an honest poor man. The king likes him, makes him his advisor. Okay, everybody else is jealous, um, and uh, they convince this king that this this uh, new advisor that he really trusts is uh, is is stealing. He's stealing from him. So uh, they take the king to the house. They come they come to a locked room, and um, and um, they. Uh, uh, they take they take the king to this poor man's house, and inside this poor man's house, they find a locked room. And they thought that in this room, they're going to find all the gold and jewels that this guy stole. And they open it up, and inside is a stick, a flute, and a little schlepping bag. So, nothing there. He didn't take anything. So the king calls over this new advisor. He says, what's up? What's going on with this little locked room that you have? And this advisor tells him, he says, in case I ever feel proud... I go into this room to remind myself of where I come from. This way I'm able to stay focused on what I have and what I'm doing. When I remind myself where I come from. So the, the nimshal, the moral of this parable obviously is that the reason why we purposely want to start out the Seder full of joy, full of gratitude, full of this mockery that Hashem had at the time and Hashem stood up for us and really took us under His wing from the time of, the, of, the, of leaving the tribe until the giving of the Torah, this incredible story. But no matter how rich and comfortable we become, we have to realize we were slaves in Mitzrayim. And you know what? We're still in exile. We still have that. We may be a lot more comfortable than we've ever been since the Chorban, since the destruction. But um, we were once slaves and we were once poor. And it's only because of Hashem's kindness that we're saved from our trouble. And therefore, we start out the Seder by saying, This is the poor man's bread. Yes, we might be wearing a kittel and everything, is, all the finery is out there. But we want to, uh, we want to remind ourselves and, uh, and, uh, and keep this focus. Okay. So halachmani, this is the bread. The achala of a son of Arad in Mitzrayim. This is the bread that our forefathers ate in Mitzrayim. Now, a lot of people have a problem with this. I, I learned in some sfarim. This is an interesting discussion. Did we eat bread? In, did we eat matzah in Mitzrayim, or did we eat matzah when we left Mitzrayim? So there's a lot of discussion about this. There's a big, big, a big, a big discussion. Some people say that no. We're remembering the Etzias Mitzrayim, but they really also had a Mitzrayim. Some say, no, we Dafka only had matzah when we, when we left Mitzrayim. But just an interesting discussion to bring up at the Pesach Seder. I haven't come out with a bottom line. It seems there's heavy hitters each way to understand it, according to those who say that the matzah was only had when we left Mitzrayim. So really, what the way to read it is, Halach Mani, this is the poor man's bread, the Halach Asana, that our forefathers ate, Ba'ara the Mitzrayim, and the land of Mitzrayim, at the time of Yitzhak Mitzrayim, at the time that we were leaving. I mean, that's how, that's how um, it has to be explained. Okay. Um, another point that, um, that my father would, would uh, point out over here is that we're inviting poor people to our house. That's the halach ma'anya. Okay? And we're calling it a poor man's bread. My father would say, look at how comfortable the sages who instituted the Haggadah want to make these poor people who were invited. Whether we invited them in show, whether we invited them two weeks before, whether they're somebody who are not really poor, but they just need somebody, uh, a house to have a Seder with and coming together. Sometimes people are just uncomfortable. right? So therefore, my father would say, we start out the Seder by saying, we're all in the same boat. Don't feel like now you're in my house, or I have more wealth than you do, or what 
however you want to, however you want to cut the pie, however you want to explain things or anybody's situation. We're starting out by focusing on the negative, not by trying to be negative, but by trying to create a comfort, a a um, um, a common a bottom line. That's what called the common denominator between us. That yes, we're inviting the poor, but we also look where we come from. It makes us more sensitive to um, to having the to having the anya, to having the poor people um, coming coming to our home. Okay. Hashata Avdi. This year we are in, we are uh, servants. The Shana Haba and in coming years we are we are we hope to be to be we hope to be free. Which means as long as we're in Golis, we really don't have chiras. We really don't have um, absolute freedom. Rav Pam asks the question which we touched upon before. Rav Pam asks that the Jewish nation are called avadim. We're called servants. Okay. Um, it says in the Torah, Ki li b'nei Yisrael avadim. Hey, right? His brother says, the Jewish nation are my servants. Moshe Rabbeinu is the ultimate Eved Neman. He's the ultimate uh, trustworthy servant. Um, furthermore, that we say in Shema, Ula avdo b'chol levalchem. Serve Hashem with all your heart. We're always talking about our servitude. We're, we're, we're like obsessed with it at all times. And we have to serve Hashem with servitude. So, what, what's the explanation of what we said before? The most free person, Eimachah ben Chorin, this last word over here. Next year we want to be free. If the sages tell us the most free person is somebody who's in the service of Hashem through Torah. So what's this whole idea about constantly calling ourselves avadim, constantly calling ourselves servants? It's not true. The more we're involved with HaKadosh Baruch Hu should make us less of servants and, more, and, uh, and create more freedom. So if Tom explains that what's a servant? He says a beauty, he brings out a beautiful point. A servant is somebody who works for the master. I work, and who gains? The master. That's the definition of an evan. That's the definition of a servant. But when a person works, and they gain, perhaps even more than the master, yes, they may be of service to somebody. We may be in the service of a shepherd. But the ultimate freedom is when I'm able to be, when I'm working for myself. And this is, Rav Palm explains, is how Yiddishkeit works. When we're actually doing the service, we consider ourselves to be servants of Hashem as far as pushing ourselves to do for the Rabbani Shalom. But ultimately, Hashem doesn't need our service. When, we, when I give tzedakah to somebody else, or somebody does a chesed for me, does Hashem gain from that? God gains nothing. When I put on my tefillin, is Hashem gaining from an Afam Teller putting on this, putting on my tefillin? I'm gaining from it. I'm gaining a relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. I'm gaining the mitzvah of tzedakah. So the way that we serve Hashem, Eilach ben Chorin, Elami Joseph B'Torah. Granted, we, the service is like the service of, of, a, of a servant, but, the, but when it comes to the service of Hashem, it's the ultimate freedom because I'm the one who's working, I'm working for me. I'm the one who's gaining out of this and nobody else. And and you know what? We say this, especially in Perky Avos, we're learning Perky Avos, right? What does it say? Um, we say, we quote the Mishnah by every parak, Ratzah HaKadosh Baruch Hu Lezak Yisrael, God wants to give merit to the Jewish people. Lefikach, therefore, here Belehem Torah Mitzvah, give us Torah Mitzvah. Why? So that we can merit. This is the difference my father always, uh, my father would say this at the, the last few years, he would say this at the Seder. It always, this question always bothered him. There's two words in Hebrew for freedom. Chorin, a ben chorin, the word we're using, and chafshi. Anybody who knows the song Hatikva? Huh? Liyotam chafshi. Right? To be a nation of free people, Baratzenu, in our land. Right? But you find this not only in Hatikva, but in the words of the sages. Right? The word chashi means free. The word cherus or chora means free. What's the difference? It's bothered my father a lot. He never, I never, he, and he, my, my father didn't know an answer. He would ask anybody he met um, uh, whenever it would uh, crop up. By the way, you know the answer. Um, so, um, one year, he was, this came up in discussion, and he happened to be standing across from Dr. Jacobowitz. 
from uh, I don't know if Dr. Joel Jacobowitz. He's Lord Emmanuel Jacobowitz uh, Zetzal's son. He's the doctor for Neri Yisrael. Um, took very good care of my parents. So um, Dr. Jacobowitz was there, and he told my father he actually knows the difference. I forgot who he quoted, maybe. Um, Marcus, Marcus Lehman. I'm not sure who he, I'm not sure who he quoted, um, but he said the uh, what he saw was the difference between Chavshi and Cherus is um, Cheru, uh, Chavshi is to be free but not elevated. Chavshi means there's nobody telling me what to do. That's all it means. That's what Chavshi means. Nobody tells me what to do. I'm free to do what I want. I have my rights, right? But a person can live, uh, to, to live a life like that is like, you know, it's, it's not that great. Okay, so I'm, I'm chafshi, okay? But a ben chorin is an expression of elevation, right? I'm not just free to do what I want. I'm, I'm a ben chorin. I'm in, I have control. Of, I have control of what's going on. I'm, I'm connected to something elevated. I'm connected to, to something, uh, to something chashuv. And um, and this is the explanation in Chazal. ben Chorin. What's a, a person who has control over themselves, right? And control over the world that has has had their lives put together. I heard a beautiful phrase. There's nobody um, a, a a sitter that's falling apart is a sign of a person who's put together. See somebody's sitter falling apart. You know that that person's put together. <laughs> person Davin, stuck others baruch Hu, right? They're using their sitter enough. And if I, was a, I had a friend in yeshiva who liked to sleep a lot, so he would always tell us when we would go out in the morning to seder. He'd say, "Use my gemara." Why? Because when you when you have a used <coughs> book, you could tell on the sides, like what page you got up. You know, the more you open it, the more like dirty it is also on the side. You know, if you have a, a bookshelf in uh, in the Tyra Belt, right, in, in, the, in the yeshiva world, nobody wants a, a bookshelf full of fancy sfar that look brand new. You want people to think you're actually learning something, and a little torn hair, a little bit messed up over there, this guy actually cracks a book or something, you know? And the shoulders put together. The show, <laughs> very good, the shoulders put together, right? A little hair, it's in use, that's right, it's in use, the stuff, uh, the stuff happening. So, so a person who's almost the Torah, a person who's involved in Torah, is a person who's ben chorin, a person who's who has an elevated type of freedom, miyitzro from his from his yitzhar. Okay, so we say hash hash avdi, shana haba ben chorin. Next year we hope to be ben chorin. We hope to be have the real freedom of being even more connected to Hakadosh Baruch Hu. All right, then we magid moves on to the to the manushtana. Now, um, manushtana talks about things that we do different. Why is this night different from all the other nights of the of the year? Okay, so the question is: There's many, many different things. There's a famous question, a big discussion, but uh, it's, it's certainly a great question to ask children. And that is, or actually adults. I don't know why, particularly children. But it's one of the four questions. All other nights we eat chametz and matzah. This night only matzah. All other nights we eat any vegetable. Tonight we eat mar. All other nights we eat we we. We don't dip. Tonight we dip twice. All other nights we could sit how we want. Tonight we need a lean. Right? Those are the four questions. Now, why don't we ask, on all other nights of the year, we drink two cups of wine. On the night of Pesach, we drink four. And if you're a wino, you say, all the nights of the year, I drink ten cups of wine. Tonight I drink four. And if you never drink, you say, oh, the night cups of the year, I don't drink any grape juice. And tonight I drink four cups of grape juice. There's many other things that we do besides for the, the leaning, the dipping. The Pesach Seder, is, is, there's a lot of stuff we do, right? We're pointing to matzah, we're pointing to this, we're doing all these sorts of weird stuff. These four things are weird. These four things are different. I don't know if it's used the word weird. These four things are different than we're doing all the other nights. What's the shot? What's the explanation here? So the answer is that there's many things we do different. But the question is, the question that we want children to ask is, why are we contradicting ourselves? And this is where I want to say is the theme of the Pesach Seder. Because the whole Seder were like, oh, we're slaves. We rock. And then we were beaten. And Hashem does tremendous miracles for us. 
Oh, and you should know about the blood that the Egyptians uh, got nailed with. Yeah, but what about all the babies that they threw into the river? If you look at the four questions, right, the first two questions of chametz and matzah and vegetables are examples of slavery. The second two questions of leaning, which is freedom, and dipping into things is another sign of freedom, contradict the first two questions. So the questions of Manishtana are not really, why is this night different? Those are what the word means. But what the, the thrust, the purpose that we want by asking these questions is to get to the theme of the whole Seder. That's how we're starting the Seder with these four questions. Because we, we're here to figure out and to discuss the difficulty that we went through and as well to then be able to begin to focus on the glamour and the, the incredible salvation that HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu uh, did, did for us as well. Okay, so what's the answer to these four questions? The answer is, The answer is that we were servants to Paro in Mitzrayim. Okay, and therefore we say, listen, we do things that show slavery, because that's where we come from as Yidin, which, by the way, when the Torah writes that it's forbidden to, to harass a convert, which unfortunately is something which continues, people won't harass a convert, but a lot of people aren't willing to welcome a, a ger or a convert into the community the same way they would anybody else, which is a tremendous avera. The Torah puts an additional prohibition First of all, it's forbidden to, to cause pain to another yin. And then there's additional pain, which is uh, forbidden to cause to a getter, to, to a convert, a person who joins the, the Jewish nation. But what's up with that? So the Torah says, why is, it, why is it forbidden? Why is it forbidden to, why is there this extra prohibition about a convert? Says the Torah, we were also converts in the land of Egypt. We were also strangers over there. Where do you think we came from? <laughs> We're any better? We're any different? Why are we treating them as different? We come from the same place. And if we do come from that, that means we have a responsibility. If, all out, if I was there and I went through that, that makes me more responsible to be sensitive and to welcome and to, and to understand and to get involved. And therefore, Avot Milafar Abu Mitzrayim is telling us that, listen, we were slaves in Mitzrayim. This is a reality. So this is who we are. This, so many mitzvahs are based upon the, the tsarist that we went to years ago when we were, when we were uh, slaves in Mitzrayim. And now it's the 15th day of Nisan. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu uh, did the Makkas and he took us out. Um, he took us out. Uh, we were absolutely free. Okay, but let's look at the words of Avodim Yimu Farah Mitzrayim. It says, we were, we were servants to Paro and Mitzrayim, and Hashem took us out. And if God wouldn't have taken us out, Harei Anu, Hanenu, 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 we would still be slaves in Egypt. It's not true. Now, God says that if Hashem wouldn't have taken us out the 15th day in Egypt, we would still be slaves in Egypt. Okay? Now, it's very easy for Menachem Tandler to say it's not true, because Hashem could do anything. Right? But, you know something? Egypt doesn't even exist. It's not the Egypt that we know. It's the same land. It's not the same people. There's no empire called Egypt. There's, it's like the place that's right south of Eilat. You know, I mean, even now, like, I just sort of like what's, what, what's the explanation over here that uh, if Hashem would not have taken us out of Mitzrayim, we would still be, we would still be slaves. We don't, you think that Pyro would still be in power? You think it would... Throughout all of the history, it would still be the epicenter of the world, which it was. Egypt back then was uh, was literally the United States of today. That's really what it was. Right? And to, how does it work today in the United States? We feel like we're, United States is the whole world. Like it bothers us. When you drive in Eretz Yisrael, the road signs are in Hebrew, Arabic, and English. Right? To me, I went to my nephew's wedding in, in uh, Montreal in Quebec, and I was like, such a chutzpah, they don't put English on the roadside. Chutzpah, right? They purposely, only French. Only French wrote this. I'm there, I have Baruch Hashem for Waze and GPS, but why do I have the chutzpah to think that it's chutzpah of them to not write something in my language? They're a different country. Why, why, why they, because that's how we are as Americans. We know the United States of America is the center of the world, right? And everything else... Is like uh, is like the St. Louis, like the gateway to the West. We're just the city. We're not the city to stay in. We're the gateway to Los Angeles. 
you know, keep going. How many people want to stay here besides for us? That's how people view it. It's like a flyover place. Right? A lot of countries we view as flyover countries. The United States is like, yeah, an, an important thing. Egypt was the United States of them. We, do we, is it really true that that's going to last, uh, that's going to last forever? The answer is that um, even if Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim would not have happened, and even if we would have been free through some other way, and not through the Yad of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, uh, we would be slaves to that entity that freed us. In other words, to explain, our gratitude is that Hashem did this. We don't want that it's natural causes or just simply history because then we just end up in another zone or in another situation where we're dependent on somebody or something. What we're saying over here is, if God would have taken us out of Egypt, we would still be subjugated. What does that mean? We need, it's such a gift that God did this. Could that just put an end to everything? That put an end. There's nobody who can claim anything over the Jewish nation. It's us and Hashem. That's it. And interestingly, when you think about this concept and this idea, this is really what the whole mission, this mission starts with Purim. From Purim to Pesach, these 30 days, what's Purim about? Why do we get drunk on Purim? It's a weird thing. It's, it's very, very strange that there's a holiday to get drunk in the Jewish religion. It's very strange. Not only is the holiday to get drunk, it's, it's a chiv. The way it's written in Allah is there's an obligation. What's up? Right? The explanation is, the reason is, and there's a lot, if you go into Allah of Purim, they all follow this theme. The message of Purim, which is right 30 days leading up to Pesach, is when a person is drunk, their inhibitions fall to the side. And it's just me, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu. People don't care what other people are thinking. They don't care if they look weird dancing for six hours straight. They don't care what people are... It doesn't make a difference. It's me and the Eidushter. Us and HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Now if a person... The Paiskim say, if a person's not able to get drunk in such a fashion, there's no mitzvah to get drunk. And if a person's going to get drunk just to get drunk, so they have any... Even if you got drunk, you didn't fulfill your mitzvah. Because the reason why a person is supposed to get a little alcohol in their system is to reach a level of what's my, really get, getting to know me and HaKadosh Baruch Hu, how close I am without anything else in the way. Nothing else in the way. That's what Purim is about. And that's what Avad Mayin was telling us also. Avad Mayin Levarab and Mitzrayim. Why is it such a kindness that God took us out of Mitzrayim? Because now, maybe throughout history, maybe things were, maybe we wouldn't still be sitting in Egypt building pyramids or whatever we were doing. Right? But if Hashem wouldn't have taken us out, our relationship would never have gone to a level of it's just me, us and Him. It's just us and HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We would always be subjugated. So we'd always be, have some sort of relation or, or dependency on something or somebody, which is something that cannot exist for Klai It's just us, and uh, just us, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu, just us, and the, and the Rabbi Nishon. One more, uh, one more vart for tonight. Um, the, um, the paragraph ends off and says, Afilu kulanu chachamim, even if we'd all be wise, kulanu nevonim, kulanu zikainim, we know, kulanu yoyim esoteric, even if we would know everything. Call that, right? We have a very, it, people who learn Torah, sometimes <coughs> it's very hard to hazard, to review things. I know that already, I want them to go learn something else. To review things is not an easy thing, right? So, but the Haggadah says, even if no matter how smart we are, kulanu zikainim, yoyim esoteric, we know everything. 
there's still a mitzvah to talk about. It's the leaving of Mitzrayim. And the more you talk about it, Harizim Meshubach, the more, uh, the more uh, praiseworthy it is. Okay? Now, I saw an interesting question. Okay? And it's, it's very basic, actually. And this is, I, this is an interesting discussion that I try to bring up at my Pesach Seder. And that is, because it gets deep. And that is, we put such an emphasis on God taking us out of Egypt, but he put us there in the first place. Don't break my arm and then tell me you're a doctor who can heal it. So I goes, Baruch who put us in Mitzrayim, there's people who have this problem, right? They have this problem with their immun. And they think like this. They say, they say, uh, why is it such a, uh, okay, God performed miracles when taking us out of Mitzrayim, but the whole thing was his fault. Well, it was his fault. That's how some people, I've, I've had people ask me this question. Right? So if he wouldn't have put us there in the first place, he wouldn't have had to do all these things. So what, what are we so excited about? We still went through 210 years of pain. <coughs> okay? So the explanation is like this. I mean, this is the discussion, obviously. It's not a, you know, you're not going to stand on one foot and give an answer to somebody who has that question. Maybe sometimes you don't even want to bring this up if people never never thought about this question. But I like the discussion. I'll tell you why. Because when a, everything HaKadosh Baruch Hu, everything Hashem does, it makes us a better nation. There's no question. Everything HaKadosh Baruch Hu does as individuals and as a people makes us a better nation. If we would not have been slaves in Mitzrayim, there's no way that we would be the Klai Yisrael that we are today. There's no chance. It's like a person being born when they're 50 years old. You're not 50 years old. You're an infant in a 50-year-old body. A 50-year-old has life experience. Okay? There's experiences. There's things I've been through that have taken me to this day, to my 50th birthday. There's an understanding of the world that I have. Some of the difficulties, the, the joys and the pains... And all these things that a person has gone through. Would you tell me that that 50-year-old is the same as a person who's born at the age of 50 and just had a gift of life in a 50-year-old body? It's a whole different thing. It's a whole different reality. Right? So if we would not have been in Mitzrayim, you could say, maybe, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if Hashem put us there. That it was, Mitzrayim was good for us. Hashem put us down in Mitzrayim for a reason. Because we would not, there's no chance that we would be the Claudius role that we are today here in St. Louis if we would not have spent that time in Mitzrayim. There's no chance. You know, Chazal tell us that, um, that um, you know, and we have to realize as well that, you know, the difference, this is a famous thing, the difference between Chametz and Matzah. If you look at the letters, Chametz is Ches Mem Tzadi. Matzah is Mem Tzadi He. So the tzadi and the mem are the same in both words. The only difference in chametz and matzah is that what the chametz has a ches, which is a total, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, right, it's three sides connected. A he is three sides, but the third leg is broken. It's really, it's the same shapes even. Chametz and matzah are the same shapes, same letters, except the ches and a he there's a little bit of a, a little bit of a break, and um, the difference in chametz and matzah is literally just a drop of ink. When you look at the words, there's one's connected with ink and one's not. And this little drop, this little this little uh, spark, you know, is the difference between whether something is chametz and matzah or on Pesach. Um, and Hakadosh Baruch put us in the triumph for a reason. We were there, and you know what happened? This is such a powerful lesson. I love talking about this at the seder. And then what happens just at that moment when our matzah was about to turn into chametz? You know, when we were, like the sages say, we're at the, about to hit that 50th level of impurity. We were struggling in Egypt. There's no question about it, right? And if we would have stayed in Mitzrayim just a little bit longer, we could have sunk to that last level, which, which uh, could have been uh, irreparable. But um, HaKadosh Baruch Hu went, and he just, just like that, we needed it up until that last second. 
And as soon as we didn't need anymore, and it wasn't good for us, out, done. I'm going to make a mockery out of the whole thing. Whoever messed with you in the first place is out the window. And I'm going to show you, uh, uh, and I'll show you Broadway, basically. Because <laughs> Baruch pulls us out of Mitzrayim, brings us to the T.S. Mitzrayim, we go all the way to all these tremendous miracles, right? Because it's all part of what we needed as, um, as Kal Yisrael. And uh, hopefully we'll pick up from here in the Akbar the next week. Shukai. Uh, sure.